scripture focus today, reading from the book of Romans, chapter 6, starting with verse 5. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we'll certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. This is the word of God. Well, we all survived Easter. That's a good thing. But know this, that uh, life does go on. Amen. And this morning, we uh, want to talk about it. We're going to finish up our sermon series for the month of April. To talk about that there's life after Easter. Uh, it's not just about going to Easter and, and just recognizing that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and then on the third day rose again. But in fact, we are aware that Jesus has risen. Amen? Amen. And it's very important for us to be aware of that. To know that he's not a historical figure that was back then, that he is no longer in the grave, but that he is alive. But I think a lot of times we question, okay, he's alive, but what's he doing? Is he on vacation? Is he on a beach somewhere? Is he in the mountains? No, he's hard at work. He's very active about his father's business. And I think for you and I, that should... Tell us that there's life after Easter. That Easter was for us to see his resurrection so that you and I could live as well. Amen. Some of us in this room might say, but Pastor Travis, how can I live when I haven't even died yet? Exactly. <coughs> Let that sink in. It's not that we just recognize his resurrection. It's not that we just recognize it, but that we live by his resurrection. And here's the thing. I may step on some toes, but, you know, I've just no. been stepping on a lot of toes lately, so might as well keep it going. <laughs> it's very common for Christians of our culture to be observers. We observe the scriptures. We observe the worship. We observe the teaching. We just don't live it. That cannot be us. Can I get an amen? amen. And here's the thing. We, we talk about this resurrection. I want to be different. I want things to change in my life. But know this. You can't have a resurrection without a death. So there must be a dying to self. Now I know a lot of us. I, I've often for myself have thought, Lord, I'm ready to die to self. In the name of Jesus, I die to self. Here we go. Well, for me... Sometimes dying to self is a everyday process. Sometimes it's moment by moment. If I'm driving in Lubbock traffic, it's minute by minute. There has to be a death. There has to be a dying of self. And that's really difficult. It's not just a, a one and done thing. It's a laying your life down. Getting used to laying your will down and taking up his. Now, here's the problem. I think that there's been a lot of misrepresentation by churches to tell you what a Christian should do and should not do. In fact, if, if I believe if the church, a lot of the churches that they had their way, everybody would look the same, act the same, go to the same restaurants, and then we would declare ourselves just Christians. Look, Jesus came to set the captive free. Amen. Imagine this. You and I have experienced captivity of self. 
if you and I had experienced captivity of life, which follow me here, none of us have. You live in the greatest country in the world. And we want to thank all those men and women who served to help us stay free. Can I get an amen? amen. But some of you in this room said, oh, Pastor Travis, I have been held captive physically. Um, because the man with the hammer said so. So, got to have a vacation. Whenever you're set free, do you just sit there? No. You should be excited to be free. You should be absolutely ecstatic what God has done in your life. I know this. If I'm really, really hungry and somebody puts something in front of me that I like, I don't just nibble at it. I chop it up while ordering another. Which in itself is a problem. I know we got to die to suffer that job. We'll talk about that in another sermon. But to be alive in his resurrection means to be different. That we are no longer the same. That we are somebody else. And here's the thing. It's not about being perfect. But it's about striving to follow the one who is. To, I want to be perfect. I want to have sin no longer. I know that I mess up. But there's a reason that there's grace so that I can confess my sin, be given, get back up and try again. Do better today than I did yesterday. We call that walking with Jesus. I know we're an instant gratification people. And a lot of times, hey, Pastor, I just want you to pray for me. I accept Jesus. High five, we're done. No, that's the beginning. These baptisms right here, this is not the end. This is not the end. In fact, we've told you, those who have been baptized here, when you meet with us to be baptized, we tell you, just know as soon as you're baptized, it's on. Amen. That it, it's, it's not that the enemy just sits there and goes, oh, how cute. <laughs> they got dunked in water. That was pretty. No, you're making a declaration. It's about me and my father. And the enemy says, well, then let's go. We're going to find out. But we're not quitters, are we? We're going to stay after it. And I want to say this too. Many people have gone and tried and have failed. Try again. <coughs> Try again. No, this Jesus thing doesn't work. No, it's not his part that's not working. It's ours. And sometimes it takes a little bit. You know, some of us, we have to learn the hard way. You know, most people, you know, are, are very compliant. Not stubborn. Some of some of us in this room have done the hot stove thing for ourselves, where our parents said, "Don't touch that hot stove." We went, "Don't you tell me what to do? I do what I want to do." Psst, okay, that's a hot stove. But now I've learned for myself. Got the scars to prove. Well, guess what? Today I want to look at two disciples of Jesus that walked with him that will never be the same again. We're going to talk about Peter and John today. Peter is the one that never kept his mouth shut. Peter liked to talk a lot. In fact, there was those moments where Jesus was walking on the water and Peter yelled out to Jesus, Is that you, Jesus? If it is, let me come out too. And then Jesus went, Well, come on then. And Peter went, what? I was just yapping. I didn't, nah, come on. And he did. Have you realized that we do that too? Jesus, if it's you, take control of my life. Let's do this. Oh, wait a second. Not for sure yet. And God's just out there standing on the water going, waiting on you. By the way, you better keep your eyes on me. There's a storm brewing. I don't want to be that person that talks the game of Jesus. That talks the resurrection of Jesus. That is just an observer of what Jesus did. 
I want to be one who's made alive in his resurrection. Amen. One who, you know, does not mind going and sharing the love of God, even if it's a bit annoying. Many of you know this because I will hug you. I don't care. Amen. Well, I, I will hug up all day long. You gonna you look at me crooked, you'll get a hug. <laughs> Peter and John. John was the youngest of the disciples. A lot of times he just kept his mouth shut. So you have two different sides of the spectrum. And remember that Jesus called Peter the rock. And you know, when you tell somebody who likes to talk a lot, like me, something good about themselves, they usually don't shut up about it. Peter's like, I am the rock. Yes. And right before Jesus got arrested, Peter the rock said this. On my life, Jesus, I will never deny you. I will die before that happens. On my life. And Jesus said this to him. Before the rooster crows today, you'll deny me three times. Peter. I'm the rock. It'll never happen. Jesus went, okay. He denies him three times. And that rooster crows. And Peter is broken because he has failed his worst. His life is over. That's when he became the rock. Amen. When he died right there on that spot. <laughs> And said, I'm done trying to be the perfect person. Lord, I'm not going to do anything unless you show me. Bam! That's when he became a rock. And from that point on, he got up, kept his mouth shut, and listened to the Father. That is great advice for me. Maybe it's great advice for you. Maybe we should, if we're Christians, maybe we shouldn't talk so much, but live much. Don't spit the game, but actually be the game. Man, that's why Jesus died. That's why he rose again. It wasn't so we would go, wow, what a cool trick. That was awesome. Glad that entertained me. No. It's to set us on fire. It's to make us different. Notice this, that the disciples, when they saw Jesus die on the cross, that was heartbreaking. And they'd been following him for three years and they went and they gathered together in a place kind of like this and, and they just held on together. And three days after the crucifixion, here comes Mary and some other disciples saying, no, we saw Jesus and, and there's Thomas there, right? And he says, I'm sick and tired of hearing about Jesus. I followed him for three years. I watched him die on the cross. He's not who I thought he was. No, 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 no. He really is alive. Unless I can touch the scars in his hands and feet, I'm not believing it. All of a sudden, Jesus appears. Bam. Hey, Thomas, what's up? To where Thomas looks at him and goes, hey, I was joking about that touching thing. And Jesus like, no, come here. Give me your finger. It's going in the side. Ah, ah, ah. At that moment, Jesus told them, I need you guys to stay here and wait. Something's coming. And Jesus ascended. And they're all sitting there waiting. What do you think's coming? I don't know what you think's coming. I don't know, but hey, that was awesome, man. Let's just keep praying because we just saw Jesus. If Jesus tells us to do something, we're going to do it. All of a sudden, they're sitting there talking. And then... The Holy Spirit shows up. Amen. And when that Holy Spirit showed up, it entered them and they were dangerous. They started praising God in languages that they had never learned. They started declaring Christ freely to the point other people heard them doing this and they went, those guys are drunk. <laughs> And Peter's like, no, we're not drunk. We are just on fire. Amen. Because you guys don't get it. We thought there was more to Jesus than him dying on the cross. And guess what? There is. Amen. We thought he had messed up, but he had gone beyond. 
John. It is no longer that Jesus was just walking on the earth to teach us. Now his spirit is within us. Amen. That we can't be the same again. There's no way I can go back to where I used to be. How wonderful that is. But a lot of us. We just sit there and go, oh, resurrected, cool. I'll see you next Easter. No. Man, I don't want that for me. I, I kind of like living on the edge. Does anybody else in this room? I mean, think about it. If God was going to put together a church of sketchy people. <laughs> He would make the refuge, wouldn't he? Yeah. Here we are. Here we are, but we cannot be a... Oh, that's cool. I'm part of the church. No. Man, and here's what happens. Acts chapter 3. This is a cool part. Peter and John, after they're filled with the Holy Spirit, this is important. Verse 1 of Acts chapter 3. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth, being carried into the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him as John did. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Amen. When all the people saw him and praising God... They recognized him as the same man who sat begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And this is important. Peter and John just went about their day like they were accustomed to. They went into the temple courts and, and understand this. They were hiding at one point because people were talking about them. And then they came out of hiding and they went to the busiest place, the temple courts. You know, people were talking about them. There they are. But they didn't care. They just went about their day, but something was different this time. Instead of going into the temple to pray, they noticed somebody was hurting. And from that point, their hearts were moved. And they stopped what they were doing in the middle of their day. And notice what Peter has to do. He has to tell this man, look at us. Here's why. <laughs> this poor man who had been going to the temple steps, to the gate called Beautiful, it was just normal for his life to be there to beg for money. That he had come to the terms that his life was about just sitting and begging. It would be no greater than it was. He'd come to terms with it. He accepted it. And he was okay with it. And he's used to the religious people just walking by. Everybody walking by. This guy's been coming here for years. Everybody knows who he is. It's just what he does. And a lot of Christian people just walk by. Maybe throw some money at him. But not Peter and John. They go to him and they see him. And they say, look at us. And the guy looks up expecting money. And I love Peter. We, we don't have any. <laughs> I do not have what you want. But what I do have is what you need. Amen. Say that. No. So I'm not giving you money, which you think you want. I'm going to give you Jesus Christ. And he's about to flip your world upside down. And I think this guy's looking at him going, how do you know? And I believe Peter and John are going, because he flipped our world upside down. Yeah. Now get up and walk. Yeah. Now follow me here. He reaches down and lends him a hand. He didn't say, 
All right, get up, try to walk, dude. Let's see what happens. <laughs> no, he went, come on. You're with us. You're one of us. People pass you all day long. You've already come to terms with who you are. Nah, -uh, we're not okay with who you think you are. Get up, you're with us. And when he got up and his legs and ankles were strong, he started dancing, praising God. Amen. Let me explain it to you. He was crippled for a long time. Then he found his legs and he could walk and run. How do you think you'd respond? You don't think you'd go, that feels pretty good. I appreciate that high five. No, you're tripping out. I bet he is running up and down. I bet he's asking people to race. I bet he wants to have a jumping contest. He's doing all these calisthenics. He's going nuts. And here's what's cool is Peter and John are like, oh, yeah. And the guy's coming back, I don't play this. And they're like, yeah, I know, I know. It's awesome. But then something happens. Word gets to the rulers of the synagogue. Hey. You know that crippled guy that sits at the gate called Beautiful? And I wonder if they went, oh, no, that guy's so annoying. Yeah, well, he's um, he's doing flip-flops right now. And I believe they're like, wait a second, you mean somebody gave him a pair of flip-flops? No, he's gymnastic flip-flopping right now. He's running everywhere. He is walking and they said, wow, what happened? Um, you know, there were those two guys that walked with um, the guy that we're not supposed to speak of anymore. You know, the guy you just crucified. The guy that you thought was a problem. And by having him crucified, you thought that that would eradicate the problem. Uh, the problems multiplied. <laughs> There's people out here, their lives are crazy because they've experienced Jesus and they went and touched this guy and now he's acting crazy because of Jesus and we don't know what to do about it. This has become a problem. Now here's what's awesome. Acts chapter 4 is when they bring Peter and John in, they have them arrested. Man, how awesome would that be on your record? Right? <laughs> Uh, Trump says here you've been arrested. Oh, for healing somebody? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I didn't get to heal them. God healed them, but I did that. And then they arrested me and beat me up. It was sweet. <laughs> they arrest them, man. They arrest them and put them in chains. They bring them before the religious leaders that had just crucified Jesus. And the religious leaders look at them and say this. I, get, I really encourage you to read Acts chapter 4. Because the religious leaders say to them, By what name and what authority did you have the right to heal that man? And Peter said this. Well, if we're getting in trouble for helping a man who was crippled, and you want to know who gave us the authority to do that? Well, then let me just go ahead and tell you. It is by Jesus Christ whom you crucified. Who is not dead, but who is alive. And who is the only one to the Father. Amen. And they were livid. How does this happen? And here's the coolest part. I'm telling you, read Acts chapter 4. The man who was crippled was with them. They were speechless. Because here they are going by the name of Jesus Christ. That Jesus healed this man. And that man's over there going, yeah. Yeah, how y'all doing? Dancing and everything. They couldn't deny it. I know that guy was crippled, but now he won't stand still. They got so scared, they asked them to leave, and the religious leaders hold together like a group of referees that didn't know how to make a call. 
What do you think? What do we got to do? I don't know. We can't do anything. Because it happened. It's right there in front of us. What we thought we killed is actually multiplied right now. Amen. That's when they came to the realization. Watch this, ladies and gentlemen. Hear this today. They came to the realization. We cannot stop this. Amen. Oh, guys, listen. You know, in the proverb from way back in the day that says, haters are going to hate. <laughs> Nobody wants to see you get better. They can't stop it. The only person who can stop it is you. It's me. When we decide just to observe and not to be about our father's business. And I know right now some of you are saying, but pastor, I got too many, too many issues in my life. I promise you, start being kind in the Lord. Start seeking his face and see if he doesn't show up. It's not going to be easy. You're going to have to die to self on a daily basis. I know I do. The man is great. I believe this. Whenever they got released, Peter and John, they went back to the disciples and told them what happened. The disciples were like, how did it go out there? We heard John arrested. And they went, yeah. Well, there we were walking just to go into the temple, minding our own business. And then there was that crippled guy at the gate. And you know, Peter, he can't stop, <laughs> went on there and healed the guy. You know, he told him about Jesus and he was healed and that made everybody mad. And so we got arrested and beat up. But here's the coolest part. John's like, let me tell him. Peter's like, no, let me tell him. No, let me tell him. This is awesome. They told us to stop talking about Jesus. They told us never to speak of his name again. And they went, what did you say? We said, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We told them, if you're going to kill us for talking about Jesus, then you better get to killing. Because we can't go back to who we used to be. Right. We can't. You're doing me a favor if you're going to kill me. What, you want to talk about that on my resume? When I get on the other side of eternity, how did you die? For Christ. Amen. Some of us would be like, I walked out in front of a bus. <laughs> Why'd you do that? I don't know. <laughs> but this, to be different than who we used to be. And I know we're an instant gratification people, but I'm talking about the process of being more like Christ on a daily basis. Amen. That if we fail, we get up and we try again. And we try again, but that we take that love that he shows us out there. Amen. That we don't care what else is going on in the world. We don't have time because we have hurting people right in front of us. And all we need to do is love on them and give them a helping hand. Love them the way that Christ has loved us. You know what we call that, ladies and gentlemen? We call that refuge. Amen. <laughs> refuge is not a church. It's a way of being Amen. that we can go out there and make a difference. And it doesn't have to be a grander difference. The smallest things make the hugest impact. Encourage somebody tomorrow. Pray for somebody tomorrow. You should have seen me this morning. I was in the shower. Okay, maybe you shouldn't have seen me this morning in the shower. As I just said that, that didn't sound right. <laughs> Anyway, <clears throat> I was in the shower and me and God were having a, a conversation because I had a bad attitude this morning. And I don't know about you, but it's one of those deals where you're going, man, I can't believe that person or this person. Man, Lord, you know what? And about that time as I'm starting to feel myself get angry about a certain individual or certain types of individual or people that God went, hey, 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 what's going on with you? He said, it ain't about them. It's about you. And I had to, in the shower, say, man, God, I'm sorry I did it again. Man, please forgive me. Help me, Lord, as I go forward. I don't want my bad attitude to get in the way of our relationship 
And man, I want to do that every day, every moment. And if we do that, ladies and gentlemen, I promise you, we are just seeing the beginning of what God is going to accomplish here with us. Now, I know some of you are in this room right now. As Pastor Brian just got done baptized, he came to this refuge because somebody made him. Pastor Brian did not want to come here. Pastor Brian was not looking for anything but to shut somebody's mouth because they wouldn't leave him alone and say, you got to come to this crazy church. But God started doing his thing. And he's not done with Brian. He ain't done with you. He's not done with me. But in this, we're here for a reason, God. All of us, we're here for a reason. It's not to observe church. It's to be the church. Some of you in this room are so stubborn. And you're bullheaded. Can I get an amen? amen? Pretty strong amen right there. Do you think God made you that way on mistake? No, he made you stubborn and bullheaded for the right reasons. Man, if we would fight sin the way we used to fight for our desire to sin, oh, oh my goodness. Think about that. Many of us in this room, we had that disease called issues with authority. But now that we've submitted to the authority, why don't we be stubborn to do what's right? Why don't we be stubborn to love well no matter where we are? Everybody at your work is in a bad mood. You be in a good one then. Right. You walk around now and say, everybody better be in a bad mood. You getting hugged right now. All right, maybe not hug because they might have a write up on that deal, but they encourage me. Be that person. That's why we're here. And listen to me, many of us in this room, you got scars. We all have scars. But because of Jesus Christ, those scars are healed. Those wounds are getting stronger. We're able to overcome things because of Jesus Christ. Man, let's go out there and show those who don't know that there is a way. That's refuge. That's what we do. Why is Pastor Allen to come up and see around? You walk out, you might be helping somebody right now. That's right, I talked about hugs, you ran off. <laughs> Here in a minute, we're going to stand up, and I'm going to go over our response of reading. The reason why we do this is so that we will know in our hearts this scripture. Because as we speak this scripture, God is doing this. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't think that God's working in your life, think about a month ago. Think about two months ago, two years ago, five years ago. And even if you're in this place right now going, Pastor, I am just starting. Great. You're going to be better tomorrow than you are today. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? You know why? Because Jesus still is alive. Amen. And so are we. So let's live for him. Amen. amen. Let's stand together. Look at the truth here together. Son of man, can these bones live? Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Prophesy to these bones. Dry bones to the word of the Lord. And I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. Yes. Amen. And we will know that you are the Lord. Let's pray together. Father God, again, we love you. We thank you, God, that Jesus was sent in our place. We thank you, God, that Jesus gave us an example, a demonstration. That God, your word bears that out. We ask today, God, that you would make us the hands, that you would make us the feet, God, that reach into a lost and dying world. That in that, God, your, uh, your spirit will be exposed. Your kingdom will be increased, and God, you will be glorified. Master, we are those dry bones, and we ask that you would breathe in us the life, God, that only you can accomplish. Silver and gold 
Oh, have we none? But God, we give all that we have. Yes, so make us that example. Make us a demonstration of your love to this world, God. We thank you for it. Bless us, your people, because they go from this place. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.